A six-year-old girl from the Toronto area is the first Ontario child to die after contracting the H1N1 virus. Our disaster series continues today with a look at the outbreak of H1N1 and its spread across the globe. Canada has now reported more than 6,000 cases, with 700 new cases over the last three days. Joining me now is Regina Phelps, the founder of Emergency Management and Safety Solutions. Thank you for coming in to discuss You're welcome. this with us and other things. And we should mention, you know, with regard to the six-year-old, they're looking at there could be other um, underlying medical conditions that mm -hmm. contributed um, mm -hmm. to her death. But one of the things that we found, you know, I guess fascinating and part of the investigation in the early going was that it was affecting young people yes. when it first started. Yes. But this is the first time we're hearing that it affected severely, if, it, if indeed turns out to be the case, with a six-year-old here. Mm -hmm. um, the issue about why it's affecting young people is primarily what's called an overactive immune response. So it's actually counter to the usual flu season. Normally in a flu season we expect really young people under the age of two or over the age of 65 to die. But now what we're seeing, just like in 1918, is what's called this overactive immune response, which means that the response is sudden, it actually fills uh, the lungs with fluid, and they die very suddenly. And what does this mean for, because uh, we have been looking ahead quite a bit, for mm. the flu season in the fall? The fall, it could be, um, well, it's really anybody's mm -hmm. guess. Currently, right now, um, it's unnerving to sort of watch what's happening in South America and Australia in particular, rapidly escalating cases, large numbers numbers of young people in particular are falling ill. So I think what we have to think about for the fall is we must be prepared for something at minimum to be a severe flu season. And how do we prepare for that? Well, for a family or for somebody at home, what I would say minimally, and this may not sound like significance, but is really about hygiene. Hand washing, more hand washing, and hand washing again, coupled with two other key things. One is not touching your face, because that's how we infect ourselves on a regular basis. And I would ask every one of your listeners, including your yourself is count how many times you touch your face through the rest of the day and you're going to be horrified. I was going to say you wouldn't even think about it how often <laughs> right you know you, wh whether it's brushing hair or however you're doing it. Exactly and the other is good hi cough hygiene. So either coughing into your sleeve or using a tissue and then washing your hands because every time you cough into your hands and then touch something else you're potentially contaminating surfaces. Somebody right behind you touches that and viruses live on those surfaces for about 24 hours. We know they're working um, diligently on trying to come up with a, a reasonable vaccine mm -hmm. for this and you know reasonably for others too would that could we possibly have one by then by no. say October no no uh, the seed stock has just been created and now it goes into production it still is made in eggs and it takes on an average six months to begin to make vaccines that are widely distributed and then when they're first available they will be held and given to select groups of individuals probably health care workers national infrastructure and then key targeted groups how closely do we work with the United States on this very closely I think the Canadian public health officials and CDC have been working very closely together, which is a great thing since we are, of course, sharing a border and all of that common air. Yes, exactly. Regina yes. Phelps, thank you for coming in. My pleasure.